Strap in, children, because today's guest is a brilliantly funny comedian who's also a really great actor. He was on I'm Dying Up Here, which was on Showtime. He's been on The Disaster Artist, Mixology, Sin City Saints, and I was just on his awesome podcast, Whiskey Ginger, where you get to drink really nice whiskey with him, and he is a fantastic interviewer. It was a blast, and both of our podcasts are coming out this week, so you can get a double dose. Definitely check out his podcast, though. He's interviewed some amazing people, and he's really good at it. So all the links you need to find his podcast will be at DougAtTrussell.com. He is a touring comedian. If you get a chance to see him live, definitely go see him live because he is super funny and super unique, and he's just an all-around wonderful human being. So without further ado... Please welcome to the Duncan Trussell Family Hour Podcast, Andrew Santino. Mr. Santino, thank you so much for coming on the show. Dude, thank you for having me. I've been really looking forward to this. We've been trying to make it happen. I know. Finally, you're here. I'm going to see you and on yours next week. Yep. And I can't fucking wait to sip some of that whiskey yeah, with you. Yeah, baby. That's going to be fun. I love it. Um, I want to, I was thinking like, what the fuck do we talk about? And because you are one of the most successfully edgy comics I know. I love and that. I love it because I love when when edgy and fearless comedy work. It's right. great personally for me because it makes me a braver comic. It's great for everybody because it proves that, uh, like we were saying earlier, this is possible. Right. It, you don't have to be terrified on stage. Right. And all that bullshit aside, it's fucking hilarious. Thank you. But so one thing I like to think about when it comes to comedy is the edge. Yeah. And um, I wondered what do you think the edge is right now versus what it used to be? Like, cause I think the edge changes yeah. somewhat over time it, or, or maybe there's more than one edge, but what do you think the edge is? That's true. That's interesting. I think like, um, because Comedy, I've, I've talked a few to a few comics about this, like Al Madrigal, especially. We always joked about that. Like, comedy doesn't hold up all the time. So, like, a lot of times you watch old stuff from years ago that you might have loved, and you're like, I just I'm not so funny at all anymore. You know, like, sometimes I watch old comics that I used to love when I was younger, and I don't find them funny at all because the tone changes depending on what's going on in the universe and what's going on in the world of comedy and society. And I think the the pushing things to the quote unquote edge is in my opinion simply talking about what's happening in your personal framework that most people know about that don't really say it because they don't know if they should or mm. if it's cool like right. you know i talked i talked about uh not to like do material but i was talking I, right after halloween you know i'd said like i'm a first time home owner i've never lived in a house other than apartments my like whole life and i was like i got to give candy out and i noticed that in our neighborhood it was a ton of mexican kids like tons and tons and tons of mexican kids yeah. and i had said to my wife i was like this is this is it's awesome but it's crazy cuz i thought we moved to a place where they couldn't find us. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> oh, shit. No. and of course, like the, it's a shitty throwaway joke. It was just me. And the, the audience laughs, but they're uncomfortable, but yeah. they're confused. But it's like, that's my version of, they obviously know I'm kidding. And the undertones obvious uh, are of things that are true in my world of like, I've never been in a house before. It was something that happened that I was like, yeah. whoa, this is crazy. It was like, there was like no white and black kids. I was like, where are all the black kids? Where are all the Asian kids? Yeah. It was like, all Mexican. So I'm making a comment about my real life because it's my perspective and they still laugh at the joke because they know there isn't vitriol behind it. It's a, it's an, it is something simple that comes off maybe edgy, but in truth, it's, it's a joke about our reality, about my reality. That, 
there isn't vitriol behind it. That's right. the key to me. Yeah, no, vi- there's you, no vitriol. You sparkle. You've right. got a, this. You've got this wonderful. Well, the orange hair helps. Yeah, the orange shiny. hair. Shiny. You got yeah. some kind of like. You've got this really, really sweet, um, benevolent vibe, and right. I think within that. You know, because people recognize right away whatever's in your heart yeah. isn't poisonous. Right. And because of that, what comes out of your mouth is, you know, it's no matter how, like, on paper people might look at that. I mean, because what you just said, that could be a post on fucking Stormfront. For you know? sure. That could be like <laughs> just like yeah. a commentary. Bre- Breitbart from- is going to take it and run with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it could be that. But the way you are, your spirit, it comes out in the right way. And, and by that, I mean, it comes out in a way that doesn't have that fucking thing where we go and see some comics and they go for it. Yeah. And but but behind it, it's not love, man. No, it's like they're fucking pissed. You can always tell when it's real. Right. Like like for me, like when I joked about that after Halloween, I just did that joke the night after Halloween and was, you know, and then I went into some other stuff. But like you can always tell that what I'm really teasing is the love I had for what was happening. It was like, I was loving giving candy to these kids and like making jokes about that world was because I enjoyed it. And the tone would change if I actually didn't like it. If I didn't enjoy it, the tone of the joke would be so much more obviously sliced with negative energy that it's a hard thing to articulate, but people can feel it. Like, I, I don't know how to write it down on paper to show somebody like why one version of a joke coming from someone's mouth is more, is filled with more honest hate than someone that's doing it out of complete jest. And it could be the same words, but it's just how, who presents it and in the context in which you present it, right? I mean, I just think like, it's, it, you'll ne- we'll never be able to cap put that in a capsule and show it to audiences over why that works, but it just does. Like there's something underneath it that just makes it a little bit easier to swallow because they know clearly I'm kidding. And if you're too stupid to know that I'm kidding, that's almost not my fault. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like if everybody else gets it and you don't, it's like that's on you at some point. Yeah. You know what I mean, I, I can't I can't control I can't control how people ingest my comedy. No. But I can control how I deliver it. Yeah. Hoping that it's you can you understand that like when I do something biting or quote unquote edgy you know that it's, I'm almost mocking the edginess of it. I'm joking about it being faux pas or, or, you know, not the standard way of talking about something. You know, man, here's like a real cheesy thing to say. Love, actual love is edgy, innately edgy. There is no way for it not to be. Right. People's nerfed versions of love, that's some other fucking thing, but actual like authentic like love love yeah that shit is like people like without hesitation will throw themselves on a sword for right. love right. they will do you know anything for it, it is like to me it's there's it something but so fantastically wild about love and 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 when you see someone who loves what they're doing or who it loves their craft loves their art it's beautiful yeah. to watch to witness it and, and sometimes it's like kind of scary oh, to yeah. see that especially if your life maybe you've been kind of like avoiding diving into that whatever that whatever love is totally. you know so you know i think there's something really hopeful about about it because it means that if you're a comic and you're like fuck man i can't my edgy shit i can't do it anymore it might be better to check in to like how you're feeling in general about existence yes and see if you got the bitters because that's a disease comics get sometimes i certainly have fallen prey to it where you get fucking bitter Mm -hmm. and all shitty and you feel bad and you're fucking pissed and you can't stop it right but you also know you gotta write jokes and so you write from this bitter shitty place and then that creates a feedback loop that makes you more bitter Mm -hmm. bad comedy is born from that like i think that's where a genuine lapse in your comedic timeline happens and you can feel it too. You can see, I can go back yeah. and look at when I wrote certain things and I was like, the, this could have been funny if it came from a different place. It wasn't funny because it came from like this negative or bitter or, or, or jealous place. And you can feel it when you, when you know what you were thinking when you wrote it versus now. And that's where comedy takes a hit. When you write from a real negative, bitter, like when people used to joke about um, 
or like I'll give you a, a, a new example. It's like Jesselnik, right? Like people talk about Anthony and they're like, oh, he's just so mean. He's got these, oh, the king of darkness or whatever the fuck they brand him on. Yeah. You know, like th- that, that's it. it, it that is an, a caricature he has he has created this this character he's created is what he's giving you right and the reason that anthony gets away with saying you know crass or 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 edgy or rude stuff is because that's genuinely not anthony right like that and it's so obvious that when he writes those jokes we're smiling with him because underneath it's a smile like i know it's crude and mean if he's doing an abortion joke that's not what he means. Do you know what I mean? Like what you hear is that's because society has deemed that a funny item, but what is being said underneath it is really not cruel. It just, it's just not, you know, like I said, um, this is a good, this is an amazing psychological exercise over what audiences find funny and why, because I think a lot of times people don't know why they something think something's funny. Yeah. Um, like I, I used to say, I said, I think I did it on, on, Maybe I did it on Showtime, but I did this joke where I said in my neighborhood when I was a kid, I kind of got pushed around a lot for being this goofy looking weird, you know, redheaded kid and white kids in my neighborhood couldn't stand me. Like I fought with every kid wanted to fist fight me. And I said, my neighborhood, you know, had pushed me out of being like a white boy and I had to like realign myself. And in my neighborhood, it was black, white and Puerto Rican as a kid. And I said, so white people kind of shoved me out. So I had to like find what group would accept me. And I said, so, you know, I had black kids and Puerto Rican kids. And I take a big, long pause and I say, and, you know, I'm not I'm not going to be friends with Puerto Rican people. So it's just such an easy, right. <laughs> and everybody laughs, but sometimes I sit and I think, I wonder if they know why they think that's funny. Or they just laugh at the idea that I'm making fun of Puerto Ricans and they're not that familiar with what that even means. So it must be funny yeah. to not make fun of black people. So, like, that fascinates me. When I tell jokes like that, that I go... It's interesting that you're okay with laughing at my mocking of Puerto Rican people, but then you'll get mad at another thing that has a, a higher effect on your group right. of, of whatever that may be. Yeah, I'm always so interested in how why those jokes land at cer- to certain ways to certain people harder. Do you know what I mean? Like oh, it's, sure. it's wildly interesting to me, and I think that says a lot about the psyche of an audience member. And, and what it says even deeper is if that joke when I do when I used to do that joke. When I would say that and they would get uproarious laughter, it's because they know, of course, I don't dislike Puerto Rican people. Like, they just know it. Do you know what I mean? Right. There's no way for me to vouch that, but like, of course they know that. That's why I told the joke, because if I really didn't like Puerto Rican people, I probably wouldn't have told the joke. Ooh, right. You know? Like, yeah. I you probably would've, wouldn't have said you would've that. would have hidden it away or Somehow, something Somehow, like I would have buried it in a weird right. slight. I would have slighted it a little bit differently. You know, it would have been yeah. a, little, a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more bitey, a little bit more, uh, you know, inconsiderate. You it know? would have gone off the rails. You might have gone yeah. on some, like, horrible rant about Puerto yeah. Ricans. There'd be just right. this twinge of something dark. So, something, you can see it. So, like, what you were saying is, like, you, I can, you can see when a comic tells a joke that has some cruelty behind it or the bitters behind it. Like you can feel it that you're like, Ooh, that's real. <laughs> it's fucking radioactive, man. It's yeah. like I was, man, I've gone through so many weird phases of comedy. But I was in a particularly shit place with comedy and I went up at the improv and then like Jay London was at the bar and mm-hmm. he came up to me and we're talking and goes, you know, uh, you got weird stuff going on off stage. It leaks out on stage. Mm. And I was like hurt so bad because it was, I'm like, oh, they see me. You can feel the real me. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. can and, feel it. And, and maybe, maybe the only problem is that you're trying to pretend that isn't happening. And so you've produced a fake version of yourself up totally. there and that dissonance between the two things, which is where you run to the other side of comedy which is sometimes you'll see posit- quote positive comics mm-hmm. trying to do, you know what I'm talking about? It's like mm-hmm. a brand of comedy that's like positivity comedy and they don't really feel good about existence. They're freaking the fuck out. Totally. They're waking up in the middle of the night, gritting their teeth. Right. They're losing, not that that means things are bad. You could have a vitamin deficiency or something like that, but who the fuck knows? I don't know. <laughs> you could just have trouble sleeping, man. You could just be someone who tosses and turns at night. And this yeah. is brought to you by the comforter. We do, we do an ad read for a, <laughs> a bamboo comforter. Do you really want good sleep at night? Easy transition. Well, it is weird yeah. how like sweep, sleepwalkers 
they don't why don't they fist themselves like that never happens yeah no they they, just walk and eat food usually yeah yeah but that could be a cause of teeth gritting i guess is some somnambulic fisting the point is man it's like when i see that shit yeah the either side of it which is a, a a person who has got the bitters and then that is coming out of them no matter what they're saying or a person they're saying shitty things or a person who's got the bitters and they're trying to say really sweet things it's like fuck right. both of these are attempts to what evade reality yeah to, whatever's going on it's yeah. a, it's an attempt to to shift away from um obvious pain you know to make a, to to kind of like um you know to pivot so to speak to like pivot your your this false character that you have of yourself because we're all every comedian that I've ever met and I've only, you know I'm not I'm not I'm not a wise old man but everyone I've met in my career we all have insecurities and we all have things we are just uncomfortable talking it, there's it's hard to talk about yeah you know we wish we could make it all funny but some things to some people it's just hard to do and sometimes yeah. when you do it it comes off tough like I've been trying to write jokes for fucking 10 years about my dad, about my relationship with my biological father who was a drug addict and in prison when I was a kid. And I've talked about it a million different ways a million different times. And I got to tell you, dude, it's never that funny to me. I've tried to write it funny. I've tried to like, but something, it just isn't that Mm. funny about it. It's just not, it's almost, you know, they're like tragedy is, you know, comedy is tragedy plus time. It's like, well, this is pretty tragic. And it's been a lot of time, but I just, there's not a ton of funny. Like there's not, there's, it's way more. So when I do do it on stage sometimes, when I do dabble in it, it just isn't, it doesn't work that well. It's, I found it's just something I've let go. I've got a lot of those, man. I'm curious, this, so the answer Mm -hmm. when it comes to this potential like field fields of incredible jokes about your father yeah for that to like convert into stand-up two things have to happen right or two possibilities i guess one is you could do what it seems to be like a new branch on the tree of comedy that some people are doing where they're on stage taking breaks yeah from telling jokes yes to talk about to, to, it's like figuring like a hybrid one person show stand up thing. Right. And if you do it right, it can seem really powerful, I guess, if you cushion it in jokes. And then it gives you a chance to explore like a whole new mode of performance sure. or something. And it's powerful. But I've never, I, I whenever I've tried that shit, I'm on the back just because like I, I well, we were, we're comedy store comics. And I came up with Rogan and like in the back of my head, there's always just like, you're just lazy. Yeah. You're not fucking writing enough. You're just trying to like. That's you, what it you, feels. You can't, yeah. And so then I, I, it's hard to do that and not feel a little cheap. The other thing, what is the other possibility to like for you to find some inner peace in relation to your memories of your father? Or Possibly. To, or to like, I guess like a, a psychologist would say to make amends or to um, forgive. And I talked to Dr. Drew about this on his podcast and he had said, um, what's important to know is forgiveness is very healthy and quite possibly um, one of the best things that you can do for yourself, but but it's not a necessity and it's okay if you don't. Yeah, that's I was right. like, that's so wonderful to hear and to know that like we have this idea that you're like, oh, we should always be forgiving. And at the end of the day, we should always be the bigger person. At the end of the day, we should always do the right thing. At the end of the day, you should always end up just going, I, we have to forgive at some point, you know, of whatever it is. And he was very honest and adamant about being like, no, it's a healthy thing, but it's not always the end. You don't always have to go, well, at some point I must forgive. No, at some point, perhaps forgiveness is not deserved. And that's the end of, and, and, and there's nothing deeper than that. Mm. It's not, it's not holding grudges or it's not it's not um it's not building anything more inside of you other than just you've let the situation go but forgiveness isn't a isn't a key requirement it can be just in the ether and that's kind of how i feel about certain things like that in my life that like i I, certain things i probably don't forgive but i've let it all go it just doesn't matter anymore how would you define forgiveness um forgiveness to me would would forgiveness in most situations in my life would be um 
finding a mutual ground with the thing I'm trying to forgive person or other and, and coming to kind of a consensus over like mutual agreement of peace. Like that we, I, I accept an apology. I give an apology. We're accepting our balance in the universe as people who make mistakes and we're all just trying and I understand your perspective and you understand mine. That kind of feels like a forgiveness balance. Like forgiveness to me is like just finding an equality, a balance in why things happen the way they happened and me being quote unquote okay with it. That forgiveness to me feels like you ex you admitting you're okay with something. And whether or not you really truly are, I don't, I don't know. I'm a little bit of an emotional fucking Rubik's Cube. I yeah. don't really understand myself sometimes, but... There are certain things that I don't quite forgive, but I don't they I don't harbor them anymore. Do you know what I mean? When did your dad go to jail? My whole childhood. My father was in and out of prison. When when was the first time you remember him going to prison? Well, my parents split when I was one, so I don't I don't he was never like an active father in my life. Um but I remember getting calls from jail. I've talked about that before on pocket, but I remember him ca calling collect from jail. Like that was kind of vivid memories I had as a youth. Um about like this weird life. I never could visit him. I never visited him. And that's something that my mother was pretty adamant was like, no, you're not going to go. What was he going in there for? You know, the vagueness is uh, the, the vagueness and the evasiveness. Typically what happens with addicts, he's a drug addict, but typically what happens with addicts is like, they tend to put everything on everybody else. Sure. You know, so it's like, it's their fault. It's their fault. It's this is fault. It's that fault. Granted, he grew up in extremely dysfunctional, extremely toxic place. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where I do have sympathy because I'm like, I know he came from a te te terrible, terrible place, like a, a bad home as a kid, you know? And so that makes sense to me. But, uh, you know, then all I remember as a kid was like stints in and out of prison and this negative balance of like, never showing up for things, lying incessantly about things, you know? So it's just, I lived that a lot as a kid. So I got used to it. You know what I mean? So if somebody lets me down as an adult, it just doesn't affect me the same. I know that sounds almost, that's a, it's mm. odd to say and admit it. But if somebody lets me down, I'm almost like, okay, that's, it is what it is. Mm. <laughs> like I, it doesn't hit me as hard. And yeah, perhaps that's a positive spin on something negative. Like, when somebody disappoints me, it doesn't it doesn't strike me as hard for some reason. Like it just doesn't. I don't get taken aback by people who are uh, not loyal or people that are don't stick true to what they said they were going to do for me or with me. I just I feel like it's a part of human life is uh, fucking up. So I feel like that's kind of like well maybe that's just that's just it happens. Much thank you to Audible for supporting this episode of the DTFH. I love Audible. I am a rabid Audible fan. I'm always listening to an Audible book. Right now, I'm listening to an Audible book on Buddhism about Ajahn Chah. And I just finished another great Audible book on Buddhism, which is fantastic, called In Love with the World. And also, I just finished a book that definitely changed my life because I've been going to the gym not nonstop ever since I read it, which is David Goggins' Can't Hurt Me. Audible is incredible. I couldn't recommend something more. If you're like many of us who feel like you wish you could go back to those days when you used to read all the time, but you're too busy, this is the answer. You can listen to Audible at the gym, when you're driving, at the grocery store, when you're walking through the woods, when you're robbing graves. Just stick your earbuds in and listen to amazing books. I love them. You got to try them out. You can start listening with a 30-day Audible trial and choose one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free. Visit audible.com slash DTFH or text DTFH to 500 500. They're great. It's a free book. And some of these books are like 23 hours long. Also, they've got really great original content. Like, for example, if you're if you want to get into running again, they've got like a fantastic series that's just designed for interval runs, but it's like somebody talking to you as you're running and encouraging you. They've got amazing stuff over there. Also, if you sign up for Audible, you will get access to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. 
delivered daily to the app and every month you get a uh, free credit which gives you a brand new book i love them i could go on and on about them i'm addicted to audible i can't wait when that new credit pops in it's audible.com slash dtfh or text dtfh to 500 500 you'll get a free audiobook and two audible originals and you'll be supporting the dtfh by supporting our sponsors thank you audible now back to the podcast you know once somebody told me you can trust people to be who they are i really mm. like that a lot that's really good and that, so the person will say they're one way or another and that's part of who they are is who they say they are and then there's all the other ways that they act <laughs> right and that makes up this thing that right. is the person yeah and you can always trust a person to to be like that yep and and that doesn't mean they're going to tell you the truth with their mouth but they're always going to kind of be that way yeah. and then it's hard to be disappointed when you're like oh yeah that's just the way that thing is that's the code in there right and it just does that sometimes sometimes it just fucks people over sometimes it just disappoints people sometimes it does like now that doesn't mean that's not the same as forgiveness i don't think no. i think that's just more of a kind of a way of like acceptance maybe uh, or avoiding this like you're you know disappointment for a lot of people is reminds when people are disappointed it seems like they've just they're like people who like throw themselves off a cliff onto rocks over and over again mm -hmm. like this keeps hurting me these <laughs> rocks keep hurting me yeah. and it's like well you're doing this you you your idea of the way the world works is not the what apparently not the way the world works right which is that the world does not really work it tends to malfunction it's always off kilter things are always malfunctioning right. and going awry you know that you tour as a comic you know what that's like the sound's gonna fuck up something's gonna go wrong the plane's gonna fuck up. always oh it's it is the way of things is right. that things don't tend to work according to the way we think we wish they worked would you like them if they were harmonious i feel like that's part of the beauty <laughs> is the chaos if i think my car was always on time to pick me up from the airport and the flight was on time and the weather was perfect when I landed and the hotel was already taken care of and everything was lined up. And if I think all those things landed up harmoniously all the time, we would be um, bored and like devoid of any sort of comical reaction to the world. Well, the boredom's interesting because yeah. like boredom is cool because like you look at, if you ever, the next time you're, you're lucky enough to get nice and fucking bored. Yeah. Take a look at the feeling of boredom because it's a really interesting feeling in that it's like painful. But then you, when you really start analyzing it, when I've analyzed my own boredom, I realize like, oh, shit, this is like multi. This is like a multi-layered thing. Right. And usually it's more along the lines. I don't want to be where I'm at and or I want to be somewhere else. Right. Is usually the components of boredom. So it's like when you get everything harmonized, the, it, you do experience boredom. Sure. But what? What's the boredom? Where is it? Where? What is the boredom? I think it's probably it. Well, and and I think boredom is so different for everybody, right? Like you're probably not bored often. Like I, I'm, I'm somebody who's not bored often because I feel like I'm always moving, so it's like hard to get there. Like boredom might be something that I'd strive for a little bit more. Like I wish I was bored sometimes. Come to my meditation this Sunday at this yoga studio. We I'll be do bored. One, oh, you will be fucking bored because we don't. <laughs> we sit still for forty minutes and don't talk. Or, well, or see, move. but 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 I'm folk. But see, even then, I'm probably focusing mentally on getting to a, a place. Like I'm talking about because that would probably be enjoyable. Like I pine for a day. I rem like I remember in school and not enjoying the lesson or not enjoying the class. And the level of discontent was max. It was just, cause school wasn't cool for me. I wasn't good at school. I didn't enjoy it that much. I was good at it. I could get through it. Cause I feel like I was smart enough to just like coast through on a B and I didn't I barely did work, yeah. which frustrated teachers to no end. They were like, he doesn't fucking do anything and he's still getting it's through. Cheating. Yeah, they thought that, I, they, but it was just, I just, I, ha I guess You're I, smart. I was smart enough that it would, I just figured it out. I was like, if I can just do this, I'm okay. And I could coast right through. But the level of boredom I would experience in school is something I probably took for granted because it was just, it was complete nothingness. You know what I mean? Like I was blank. I was empty. I didn't have worries. You don't have bills. You don't have families. You don't have all these things to worry about. So you're inherently bored because 
you have so much space to fill. Like now I have all so I now I'm okay. so full. Yeah. I don't think I have any room to squeeze in boredom. Like I it's I, I'm I'm a U-Haul and you've Tetris every <laughs> fucking couch. You know what I mean? Like boredom will be nowhere. Maybe put it in the front seat, but that's still not going to fit cuz we got to get out to piss. That's how I feel about those that because like I joke about it. You know, I've, t- I've joked about this to my wife that I was like, I think I think humans would live so so long if we didn't pile on societal things that I also enjoy like having a family, making children, making a home, like these things are heavy weighted things. Yes. I don't think people take into account how heavy it's heavy to start a family, heavy Fuck to yeah. get a house. Like it's so heavy. And I'm like, man, I wonder if we never had that. Would we, with the technology we have, would we live so long? Like, I feel like we might live so much longer if we didn't put a lot of societal weight and we all do it by the way, like everybody, I don't care what financial status you have. You put this, you put certain weights on yourself about your living situation, your family situation. It always piles. I was like, I wonder what it would be like if that wasn't so heavy. Like, yeah. would we have a more full life? Because I don't, as an adult, I couldn't tell you the last time that I was like, fuck, I'm bored. I don't know. Well, that's like, you know, there's like a, it's really like, to me, the thing, this this sort of, stuff that I've been taught on one level can really fuck up the video game. Like if you like, do you play video games? Dude, I don't. And it's so funny. It's like so many of my friends do. When and, you were a kid, did you at oh, all? Of course, constantly. It's, the, the, the one thing will happen in a video game, most types of video games, outside of the shooters, I guess you get some joy because you're like overcoming another person. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times in a video game, what happens is you're operating some character, a car, a thing, or whatever, and right. you move to the next level, and you're usually rewarded some extra power. Right. Like now you can fly, and because you can fly, you can take on different enemies, and then you, but eventually you're going to start realizing, like, oh shit, it's the same, literally the same pattern, mm-hmm. but the enemies are becoming more colorful, and my character is becoming more co- colorful. Right. But the pattern seems to be essentially the exact same thing right. it's like a fireworks right. show using different fireworks but the same like whatever the launching them into the same place in right. the air right yeah we went from a sparkler to now a, a massive japanese firework that has different caricatures inside of it and yeah yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. still kind of the same fucking thing. same thing essentially yeah. yeah fire in the sky and but the, and so then and like what happens is in a person's life you construct these places to get past right Mm -hmm. and so anyway the whole juggling act of modern life that is definitely heavy heavy and definitely cumbersome and definitely emotionally intense and definitely uh like perhaps definitely the most intense thing i've ever experienced for that intensity to function at the height of intensity, it requires there to be some possible other place you could be. Yeah. And now if you've made up an idea, like, you know, when you're on the road and you get to the hotel and you sit down and suddenly you're there by yourself and for a second in that great solitude, I don't know if you get it, but I get this like, <sighs> oh yeah, it's just me Yeah. and the emptiness Yeah. and quiet and I can relax now. Yeah. Right? Well, that, is an, a game that I have created, which is that I produced a condition where I that I think is a place I can relax in. Right. And I've imagined these other places are not relaxing positions. And in fact, if they were, I think I would not want to have that level of re- relaxation throughout the day because I would be superstitious. It might in some way reduce my ambition and lower my ability to continue fanning the flames of the suffering oven that I've created with my (laughs) own mind. You know, so it produces a never ending feedback loop, which is, and that's the game, which is we all have a place. Yeah. For some people, it's the couch at the end of the day. For some people, it's after a run. For some people, it's the vacation. For some people, it's fucking. But whatever the fucking place is, when you really look closely at it, that place is everywhere. Yeah. But you've pretended it's some special place. And thus, now we've got all this heaviness, right? Like, it ruins the game. That's the main thing is like, people don't want to ruin that game. Like, I want, I, you man, I want fucking have millions of dollars and a beautiful thing in the fountain and the fucking thing and the you know what i mean i want to have it i want to travel wherever i want send my kids to private schools and like oh la, 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 la. and all the things somewhere in there 
I've constructed this insane idea that when I, that happens, that's when I'm going to get the, <sighs> but when you really look, that ah, oh, it doesn't really quite come. And if it does come, it barely lasts. And then you realize, oh shit, the ah uh, thing is like, it's not, it's, it, it doesn't, it's not dependent on phenomenal, a phenomena. No. Right. Well, that's why, that's why uh, Rogan record. makes fun of me for, no, it's so true. Rogan makes fun of me for golfing. Joe likes to make fun of people for things that he can't do. You know what I mean? It's like he can't uh, golf because he knows he'd get addicted and then he'd be mad that he wasn't good enough. It would ruin him. He would get addicted. He would. And he would, he would become like, he would probably become like a, a, the, a, the greatest golfer yeah. or something. He wouldn't be able to stop is nope. the main thing. So like for me, he makes fun of me. He's always like, why do you like that lame sport so much? And that is my, ah. Uh, yeah. I love it. I disappear to a world of no work th thought, no love thought, no like emotion. There's no emotional connection other than playing this little specific game. I, it's very, very, it's, dr it's drugs. It's wonderful drugs when I play golf. I don't, I can't explain it. I think everyone that plays knows it. It's like a beautiful escape with zero consequence. If you're if you're balanced, right? So like if you're bad at golf and you're still having fun, it's perfect. And if you're good at golf and you're not and you're fucking up and you learn to just let it go, it's perfect. Like there golf is one of those sports where it wow. doesn't really matter if you're good or bad. If you're good at being okay with either, it's perfect because you're in nature. It's peaceful. It's very quiet. It's usually very serene and beautiful. Usually. I mean, most golf courses are beautiful places in nature. And you just get to just do it. And it doesn't really matter. Like, it's just one of those things that, like, there's no consequence. It doesn't matter if it works or it doesn't work. You're figuring it out. It's very much like life. Like, How many people did you just hook on golf? I mean, I can <laughs> feel the pull now. I, I hope they it. try. <gasps> it's so peaceful, dude. It really is. And it used to be a rich white man's sport. It used to be kind of the stigma. And now I think people are learning. It's like, you don't have to have a lot of money. Public courses are quite affordable. A shitty bag of clubs can be found at a garage sale anywhere or your local store where you can go buy them for, you know, a hundred bucks for old shitty clubs because you don't need fancy clubs. And go do it. Just go try it. And I promise you, if you can laugh off, if you can laugh off not being good, you will love it. I think it's, I mean, it seems to me to be one of the more psychedelic sports out totally. there. Well, it's and by the way, side note, it is very, very fun to ingest uh, things and do. I, I, I like uh, smoking weed and playing golf. I yeah. very much do. I have tried other stuff ironically i don't like drinking and golfing a lot of people love drinking and golfing like that's kind of a traditional yeah sure i'm not a huge fan because when i'm drinking i don't really like to do activities no <laughs> i'm not a let's go drink and and do a sport that's not my thing i mean what let's hold on real quick let's just go through the drinking sports right now because yeah. it's like bowling yeah bowling darts yep golf pool pool yeah, yeah. what else i mean anything in a bar shuffleboard shuffleboard uh, not tennis. No. Not football. Nope. Not baseball. No, nope. not basketball. No, not none ba of those. Nothing that requires any kind of like, you know. Cardiovascular like, yeah. movement is hard when you're drunk. It's the one thing that I can't go to the, like, I know people who will drink and go to the fucking gym. No. Never in a million years no way. will I do that. No, but I can I can smoke or take a little pill and go to the gym. You and can take acid. I can right. take ketamine, right. weed, you right. name it. I can be on just about any Anything. fucking drug painkillers speed right. i've never tried cocaine at the gym but i'm pretty sure, I'm sure it, would it would work, work. yeah <laughs> the booze at the gym no fucking no. way and to me i think this is more of a indictment of booze than anything else True. it's like fuck how bad is it for you that it's like really fucking up your ability i you know what i want to backtrack a little bit ketamine and the gym they don't go together that they don't well, to be quite honest la fitness They're used to have a ketamine corner where if you were fucking <laughs> <laughs> If you had a K corner, if you're falling into a K hole and, and LA Fitness was like, and we have a K corner. <laughs> a treadmill for the K. But you but no, you're right, actually. As someone who loves alcohol, um, I have found that what I love about it is that it's is when I'm sitting in my home with someone, um, having a drink and having conversation because I think it's wonderful yeah. at 
activating these like synapses in our brain of especially you know what it does for me it digs into the memory crates it's very odd marijuana and like pot affects me in a way where i get very involved in what i'm doing like with you right now like i'm i really enjoy i'm enjoying it a lot yeah likewise with alcohol um i start to dig into the crates of like maybe the first time i met you or the first time i saw you and it's something that pot doesn't really do for me pot is way more a live in the now thing yeah and booze tends to bring out this like kind of historical file in my brain Mm. like that to me is what i do value about i do enjoy having a conversation about the past with people with alcohol and that's in my opinion the history of alcohol most times it was first of all used for relief and aid you know what i mean sure and also it was almost a way for people to escape tragedy you know it was a way it was a shared communal thing to get rid of pain from war or famine or fucked up shit because it's because it does dilute your brain it's not really positive for your brain it kind of washes away negative and pain and inhibition which I think can be good for humans in very small doses. Oh, yeah. The problem is uh, our culture has led us to becoming okay with just blacking out. That it's like totally acceptable. That's right. To damage your brain. (laughs) To literally, it's so acceptable that the government is chill about it. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Totally cool with you. mind-blowing, isn't it? Ruining your brain. Yeah, I mean, they support it. They subsidize it. One of the biggest agencies is alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. And that's... A yeah. faction of our government that is supportive over uh, something that literally tears us to pieces and, and, and does bad, bad things. A family member's friend, I won't mention, she just passed away of, um, what is it, at your liver, cirrhosis? Cirrhosis. Yeah, at 40 years old. Wow. Uh, the doctor said the um, images of her liver that were taken were that of someone who was a alcoholic for 30 plus years. I, I followed her liver on Instagram. It's, you did? Yeah, it's fucked up, man. It's I'm so fu- it's so fucked up. I, well, I got to tell you, though, the posts were incredible. I know, great Some philosophy. of the great posts. <laughs> really good poetry. <laughs> really good fuck, poetry. The depth was there. The yeah. depth was there. But at the very end, you know, I had to unfollow. I couldn't. Well, I'm working on this thing right now for alcoholics. It's liver makeup. So it's like you can to actually get like, the spots away. Blush and like, yeah, just like generally like wow. shine up your liver so that it looks fucking great (laughs) the problem with alcohol any of these things but any of them um they all even weed to some degree but barely weeds like tea or something but like to me long-term use of any substance it does lead to a kind of like metamorphosis that usually isn't uh, aesthetically pleasing True. you know it's it, it's a you're gonna people start you know there's something terence mckinnon said addiction is repulsive and mm. i think that's a really good description of it it's yeah. like something about seeing a person out of control and is i think just on one basic level it's kind of scary man like oh, very you know my dad struggled with alcoholism and that was a really scary thing to be around because to have a dad that on one one phase of the day is like a normal person but then on the other phase of the day is a roll of the dice Uh. that's scary but fuck that's just like in a family situation where i guess there is some survival involved but like from a tribal perspective an evolutionary perspective you couldn't really run a functioning tribe if there was a member that from that couldn't stop themselves from eating a thing that was obviously poisoning them right so it might be built into us to really hiss at addiction to really look at it unfavorably and to really like have a kind of like i mean like it sucks but when i'm around a true dyed in the wool hardcore dedicated to their own self-destruction level addict i go the other fucking direction yeah it's hard i used to not be like that i used to you know you were talking about how your dad has impacted the way that your expectations of other people happen in the world yeah and we all get imprinted by our fathers one way my father imprinted me was i at one point would gain an unhealthy this is such an embarrassing fucking like limp in my personality where i would like find a a toxic dude you know who was like kind of like you know powerful hopefully something was really fucked up about them right and then i would like try to help them 
Oh, wow. Oh, like a it, fix it. You're, you want to be a fix it guy. It's, you're supposed to do that with like the, 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 the people you're sexually attracted to. Yeah. yeah you someone know you want to fuck. Yeah. Not platonic. No. White knight stuff with dudes right. is like really like embarrassing. But I didn't even realize that pattern was happening in my life until like my, my father passed away or so a little time before that. And then I'm like, oh my God, I keep trying yeah. to repair my dad as he was when I was a kid. Through through someone else. You were doing it through whomever you were gravitating towards. Let me teach you yeah. how to yeah. find oh. something. Oh, so awful. And they, so no, no fucking boozing, fucking carousing dude wants to have somebody fucking <laughs> whispering <laughs> An mantras. emotional shaman while they're trying to black out. <laughs> oh, so embarrassing. No, but that's, but it, but, but, but that's so normal. That's like so normal. It's, it's, it's it's insane how normal that is. Everybody has those things. Whatever that is, we all have that thing. It just it takes it manifests differently for everybody. Right. It takes shape in different ways. You did it because it was familiar and it probably felt pretty right. Like whether or not you knew it, it uh. probably was pretty right in your in your high functioning version of of whatever it was. It probably felt pretty fucking oh, good. Yeah, my friend's being a dick to me. It was kind of good, is right? Awesome. Yeah, it probably yeah, felt true, oddly good. True friend here. Yeah, yeah. My bu- that's how you know it's a true friend when they treat you like shit. shit. Yeah, yeah that that's thing. something about that is so real for every everyone has that pattern. Whatever it is, whether whether it's fixing people or taking abuse or walking straight towards abuse. Like some people love abuse. Some uh, people get off on abuse, yeah. and without it, they seem like empty and lost. And but we all have that, dude. We all have our you know, not to sound cliche, but we, we definitely all have our flaws, but our flaws are only magnified if we choose to accept them, right? Then you go, oh, it's an embarrassing limp. I'm grossed out by it. It's like kind of weak. It's such a weak yeah. part of me. But otherwise, you wouldn't really have known. If you didn't if you didn't look at it and, and realize it, it would just keep happening. That's and then right. that's more toxic that's that, way more toxic yeah and and how about the thing where like when you do acknowledge the thing and if you do it out loud to the wrong person they'll be like don't be so hard on yourself right you know it's a you know don't it's okay or they'll try to like put lipstick on the fucking mm-hmm. grotesqueness mm-hmm. and it's like no allow me my personal revulsion and right. because i'm revolted by a like weird code that appeared in my personality and the program of my identity doesn't mean i hate myself it's just i'm allowed to look at that and look at the whole spectrum and be like oh that's fucked up that's right. a real like weird thing that i don't like and and i think that's another important part of, of accepting it is like not trying to put lipstick on the fish like really looking at it and being being like oh yeah like when like when i look in the mirror and I haven't been working out, I'm allowed to be like, I'm fucking gross, gross right now. Yeah. I don't have to be like this. I can run. My knees are working. I can exercise. I don't have a disability right now. I can fucking get out there. Right. And it's fucked up that I'm not doing that. I think that doesn't, you know what I mean? I, yeah. To me, I there seems to be something in our culture, which is uh, to somehow want to rev- like look at a thing differently than it actually is and then mm. and, and in that comes the possibility of allowing a thing to live in your house that doesn't need to be there anymore right. we're afraid to evict subjective tenants these days you to- know? totally well it depends on who's it also that that balance depends on who's aiding in our you know like if your wife or significant other or whomever like if you look in the mirror and you say Oh God, I look so gross. And they say, no, you don't. You know, they're supporting your mental well-being because they love you and they care about you. But you genuinely wish that they would go, yeah. Yeah, you look a little gross. That's right. But but because they love you, they just can't get there. And even if they did do that, you know it would be disingenuous you know yeah. if, if they did say like okay if when you go no tell me i look gross because i know and they go okay you you've been in better shape but it just doesn't hit the same you're like no you should feel what i feel which means that what you've constructed 
is probably not that real, right? That's that's kind of where like I think body dysmorphia comes from and people's yeah. body images of themselves. It's because your version is so much worse always. You know what I mean? Like you are mm. going to be your toughest critic if you have that personality, which I think most people are tough critics of themselves. You know, if you have any self-preservation. But like someone else who really cares about you is never going to join that party. You want them to because you right. want to go, give me the fucking motivation to hate this as much as I think I do. But they won't give it to you because it's just not true. Right? So I think you've constructed mm. in your own mind the most the most negative version of it. And it, it, because it it probably will never exist. Because you your brain is so powerful to go, you're the fattest and ugliest you've ever been. <laughs> you're gross, dude. Yeah. You're gross. All I need is a little validation to get me through this. So you want someone to go, you are gross. So you go, see, we knew it. We knew it. And then, but then it shouldn't stop there. And I know right. what you're saying. It's like, to me, just because we were talking about forgiveness in the beginning. And I think this ties into that to some degree. It's like, I think a huge part of forgiveness mm -hmm. is to completely acknowledge to the best of your ability what happened whether you are the person who hopes someone forgives them or whether there's someone who hopes you forgive them mm -hmm. what actually happened because i know in my mind with my dad and uh there have been times where i've felt guilty just looking at it as it actually was you know like there's a sense of like oh i can't even like think the truth and you know since i had a kid and now i'm looking at this beautiful child and i'm like you are never gonna be in a fucking apartment in college station texas surrounded by pornography while i'm off at fucking work and then going to a bar that's never gonna happen to you ever right never gonna happen but for me to like get to that point i need to acknowledge the totality of the terrain that i was living on and then instead of just stopping there which is, i think where victims stop is they're like ah yeah that fucking sucked oh fuck then now that you have that you can it place it on a weird spectrum a continuum of what could have happened uh, and so this is where where this thing this neville goddard shit i'm listening to when he talks about forgiveness the way he talks about it is not the way it's commonly understood as i've commonly understood it which is generally some kind of it's the same thing like uh, i said what are you gratis what are you grateful for and then you're just supposed to like express right. some bullshit. You're not feeling gratitude, but you're like, oh, I'm grateful for the trees. You're not feeling anything. You're either numb or blank or you really don't give a shit or you yeah. feel awkward. That's not real gratitude. That's just putting on a show. Similarly with forgiveness, because it's fashionable to have some monster in your past and then weave the story of the horror and then weave the story of your grand forgiveness. Right. Even though inside you're still fucking just walking with a limp, you're still confused and pissed and in denial. That's not forgiveness. So Goddard's version of it that I like a lot is, and it's psychedelic and it seems on one level, maybe like delusional or something, but his version of it is take whatever the place is that you want to forgive, <clears throat> go back there in your memory bank, some whiskey, and then revise it. So now it's like, for me, that would be, oh, I'm in like a non-divorced household where my dad and my mom are really in love. And my dad has not succumbed to uh, alcoholism, and, uh, but he still loves life. And he's still funny and he's still, and he's excited about being alive. And my mom is not struggling with her own issues and her own troubles and 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 they're they're really focused on me and my brother my brother is like a big brother who like isn't trying to like get his mind to wrap around 18 fucking addresses that we all moved to over the course of our childhood or whatever and then in that you live in that place as that family and it's really really powerful man wow. because if you really do it and it's number one it takes some courage to do it because it's heartbreaking 
Yeah. Because to do it, you've got to fucking like acknowledge the other side of what you experienced. And, but then one and that heartbreak is good. You should feel that. That's what you should feel. It's natural. Yeah. Yeah. And then from there, suddenly you start reliving things as they, as they, as, as they could have been. And then within that weirdly, because all that memory shit is, is like stored, like, uh, neurotransmitters that yeah. are expressing themselves in a certain way within that there seems to be some kind of authentic relief that comes that awful cord that maybe you still feel tight as fuck between you and your dad it starts like loosening somehow and i think that's what goddard calls forgiveness is revising your past mentally until you are or it's not the memories you're having are memories of the a perfect thing wow. that didn't happen <laughs> it's crazy it's crazy yeah. have you done that I do it all the time. Have you done it with your father and your his, your past? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I do any time. So like, I've got like. Fucking, do you think it took his death to do that? Hmm. So that that that's like a big thing that I that I've uh, you know st studied and tried to figure out about. Did your dad is no longer with no, us? No, no, he's alive. But I think about this is so dark. Hmm. I think about. I'm like, if he passed away, how would I feel? And that's a f crazy thing to say out loud. Because if you, if I said, if I said, what if, you know, you and I aren't super, super close, right? But if you passed away, I know how I'd feel. It, it would bother me a lot. Thank you. It would hurt me a lot. It'd bother me a lot. It would, it would really hurt. It would hurt me too. So well, you'd be dead. I know. It wouldn't hurt. There's no more pain after this. That's a different podcast, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> but Thank I don't you. know how I would feel if he passed away. I think that's a really, really dumb. And I feel like millions of people feel the same way as I do about something in their life. That they're like, I don't know how I would feel. I couldn't tell. I really couldn't tell you. I well, couldn't tell you. And I'm super scared to find out because I don't know. You really might not care. I might not. No, I might not. I, I my my hope is somewhere in the middle. My hope is yeah. somewhere in the middle. But I've but of all the death in my life, like I I was never good at crying. I learned that young. I remember going to my grandmother's funeral and sw staring at people crying, and I just couldn't do it. I was like, why can't I cry? Something's wrong with me. I felt like something was wrong. But I just that I don't I don't have certain triggers. I just like yeah. I just some for some reason like I would cry. If I saw somebody give a homeless guy a meal and he had like a really like genuine reaction to it, that might make me cry a little in my car because it would make me think about a lot of things. Yeah. That's quicker to make me cry than when somebody passes away. Yeah. Oh, God. Nothing I, worse than grief pressure. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's just like the, the, the weight of that. The weight of like, why aren't you feeling so bad? And you're like, I don't know, dude. I don't know. If I knew where the, tr where the switches were, I would have flipped a lot more of them no shit. You know what I mean, I would have changed a lot of this fucking technology if I could, but I don't have. I don't know where the, all the buttons are. I don't. I have no idea. You know. Yeah, it's I, no cool. clue. There's, it's, they, they, and when you fight, think you know where the fucking buttons are, then another th those buttons open up a secret room that's got right. a million more buttons right. that has buttons within <laughs> right. buttons within right. fucking buttons. We are just a million buttons. Ah, a million buttons. Like, did you see the Joker? Did you watch it? I did. Okay. Be, just because I'm so interested in the way you, th like so many people I, I don't want to talk to about it because a lot of people I, they just don't have anything interesting to say. <laughs> yeah. It's either like, F I, I fucking hated it or it's mm -hmm. like, or they go into the cinematic version of why they liked it. I'm interested in how you as a performer and a person felt when he became a little self-aware of his mental instability. Did you, did you feel some sort of connection to that? Did mm. you feel, did you see parallels? Did you see, mm. because I'll get mine out of the way fast because I want to hear yours. I, I felt an honest, genuine connection sometimes to the instability of what my career and our lives are. Oh yeah. Of performance. And obviously I'm not going to fucking go shoot up somebody. Although there are a couple of late night show hosts that I would put, no, <laughs> but, but I just was like, 
I had moments that kind of scared me. I'm not going to lie. That scared me into thinking like, whoa, I have heavy emotional things because of perform what performance does to you and what living in the world of performer, a performance art or whatever yeah. does that I saw odd parallels of like, sure. you know, of like, man, that it is really difficult when you're trying to give and people don't want what you're giving. Yeah. And it's, there's this weird thing that happened. So I shared some of those things. Sure. And it gave me a, a lot of uneasiness. Do you know what Whoa, I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do yeah, 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 you yeah, know yeah, what yeah. you mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the to me, like, that's kind of the always been the satanic aspect of the way that late show hosts. And I think that's why it's a great choice is to, like, have it on a late night show or totally. whatever. But, but the, to me, it's sort of like the you get presented by this like unremitting, never changing, powerful, charismatic, somewhat cynical, fashionable personality night after night after night. And it gives you this illusion that people are one dimensional and that mm -hmm. that's normal. And so like the Joker here, you have this thing that I, I, on one level, I guess you could say is like, oh, look, there's a, not a crazy person. There's a person person. You're just seeing the reality of a human being, which is a, fucking crazy thing that knows what it is sometimes doesn't know what it is sometimes surprises itself by a thing that pops out intentionally deceives itself we are self-deceiving creatures that's wild what other yeah. creatures trick themselves what is the evolutionary <laughs> advantage of that man fooling yourself into thinking you're away or not that yeah. doesn't seem if anything it's got to like there's got to, that's got to use a lot of processing power to like but i believe there's reason I believe there's reason that we self sabotage and, and self. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think it's evolutionary, but I think it's. Uh, I I think we do that to test ourselves. It's why we love self destruction, right? Like we like not to throw back, but like it's why people drink and they get hung over, but they still want to drink again. Yeah, we love testing limits, and that translates to athletics as well. Like people that work out, like that. You know, David Goggins runs 800 miles breaks his body yeah it, it's it's terrible for your body at yeah. some point we love to test ourselves and i be would believe evolutionary it's why we're so strong so i would say it actually is a benefit because we're such an advanced machine we are able to break and fix ourselves at such a remarkable rate compared to other creatures yeah. both physically and mentally i think that's why we continue to do it we push the limits because we know um, if we pushed it too far and it broke all the way, we would be remembered for it. Or, 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 oh God, I was about to say something it's so much more dark. <laughs> say it, say it. I was going to say we'd be free. Or we'd be free. Yeah. It, no, it, but it, perhaps that is, there's truth in that. No, seriously, like when people overdose, when, when famous people overdose, we have, we have always in our culture, regardless of how sad the overdose was, we have posthumously held them on this beautiful pedestal of like they just went too far but fuck it was awesome yeah man yeah like we love we do we love it. every junkie's like a setting sun <laughs> <laughs> neil young you know. we just we just have this beautification of self-destruction like we love it where there is it's beautiful to break ourselves so why we self-sabotage why we self-destroy why we get in our own way I think is to test the, the lim we love testing our limits. I just, let me see if I can keep going. Let me see if I can push it. And this translates to what we do for a living. Dude, I want to see what I can say. Let me see what I can make up. Right. What can I, can I talk about the remarkable nature of refrigeration and why it's important to our society today? Sure. Okay. I'm sure I could write some <laughs> funny should. jokes about why refrigerators are remarkable and it's amazing that we have technology that keeps things longer Jokes, than it ever did. Let's start a podcast on refrigerators. <laughs> That's possible. But you go, I'd rather talk about pushing something to the edge of what I know and you know might be uncomfortable because it's it's why we it's why we break ourselves. Like you break yourself cuz you're like, can we do it? And when you do it, you're like, fuck. We did it. Holy shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, like when man. you make a mental breakthrough, when you're on a psychedelic, when you have an, a mental breakthrough, when you have the 10th mile that you get to run, when you do the thing, when you get to these little kind of mini little achievements in your, in your mind, 
it's like you beat yourself. It's the it's a phenomenal feeling. It's an amazing like whoa. I I, I think it, yeah. I, lately, man, and I've been thinking of this in terms of multiverse navigation. Yeah, because like Goddard. The like his concept is when you're revising the past, you're literally like not revising the past because everything's happening at once. You're placing your attention on a different dimension where that actually happened and Whoa. tuning into that because there is no past. It's all happening in the moment. It's all happening right now. Wow. So this is like so when when you have a prison break, so to speak which is whatever your perceived limitations are, you transcend them, then I think you're jumping timelines and you jump from the timeline where you are limited to an, a, a more unlimited timeline. And in that, you don't just experience changes that are induced by dopamine or serotonin or, or, or like a body changes or you're able to lift heavier things. You also, I have noticed that other things like like we'll just get brighter. Oh yeah. My joke writing gets better. My relationships get a little better. Yep. I have more inspiration. It's almost like I'm in a completely different part of the universe. <sighs> Dude. So it's like navigation. You're leaping timelines. You're, every time you do that, you're leaping. This is how I make myself run. Because I've been, I've got the fucking Goggins bug as many of us have. And I've yeah. been like, you know, working out. And the way I make myself run five miles is I say, between me and a different dimension is five miles on this treadmill. And when I get to the end of those five miles, I'm gonna be existing in a parallel universe where I overcame the part of me that used to be unovercomable. And that is when, that's what trips me the fuck out because now I'm in a brand new day. Right. It could have been the day where I didn't do the five miles and it could have been the day where I did three miles and it could have been whatever. But now I'm in the day where I did it. And that's a new dimension. It's a new land. Right. I'm fucking Christopher, subjective Christopher Columbus. And like, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and it's we, true. We all want to travel like that, yes. you know? And sometimes we, sometimes all we really need is to put ourselves mentally there, knowing that you're going to get to a new dimension. And when you do, you will be, right? It's almost like... I talked about heavy, heavy, heavy panic attacks in college because I had ocular migraines. I would go blind. I talked about it on my podcast wow. in great depth. Yeah, crazy, right? I would go blind in my right eye and then my left eye vision would be a little distorted, but I'd go blind in my right eye. So I'd have violent panic attacks. Um, and so much so that I was in the hospital for a little while in and out because they couldn't, I was trying to figure it out. And anyway, when I subsided, when this kind of calmed down, so to speak, I'll never forget, dude. I was walking down the steps of my college apartment and I stopped at the bottom and I looked up at my roommate in the loft and I go, hey dude, when did we get this done? When did you get this done? Like his parents owned it. So I thought maybe they got it. And he goes, what do you mean? There was a, a sun, a massive sun made out of like tiles, hand placed in the front door. Yeah. And I was like, when did you guys get this done? And he was like, we, that's, that's all that's been there. That's been there literally since you came here. That's, we bought the place that was there. Yeah. And as I walked to walk that day to work, I, I, will never forget the feeling was scary and overwhelming because I felt a little scared. Like, how have I never seen that? You know what I mean? Like I felt sure. like I tri but then there was this realization that it was like, oh my God, that's like so many things. I, you just don't see them because you, it just, in the dimension I was in before, it, it I wasn't noticing enough. Yeah. I wasn't paying enough attention to certain things. Perhaps that's why I was getting such bad anxiety and panic was because I was living in tunnel vision of just focusing on like collecting enough money to get the fuck out of Arizona to move to Los Angeles so I could start my career, collecting enough money to, I, it was just like I was in a yeah. fucking zone. I was in a zombie zone, not, no, not noticing shit. And the panic attacks and the ocular migraines triggered um, me learning more about this new dimension I, pro I was placed in. But I, dude, I'll never forget that feeling. It scared the shit. I've never been that scared in my life. It's scary. Because I saw it for the first time. It was like, whoa, how have I never seen this? I've lived here for two years. Yeah. And I've never even seen it one time. Yeah. But then when I saw it, it all made sense. I was like, oh, oh my God. It's because I just haven't been paying any attention to almost everything around me. And that goes as dialed and detailed as that to many other things, friendships, relationships. It was all sorts of stuff. 
So well, I, where where does that end? What's the edge of that the <sighs> perceptual field? Like, what else are you not seeing right now? Well, I mean, so many things, right? Like, I need. That's why I think things like that happen in your life to make you see again, either the dimension you're living in or the new one you are shifting into. Yeah, I think things happen in our lives, tragic or otherwise, to once again re-remind you that this is insane. <laughs> This is insane. What's happening is insane. My mind is like looking at that over your shoulder occasionally, yes. that board with wires, and I can't stop going back to the idea that I have no idea <laughs> what it is and how you did it, <laughs> but I'm more fascinated by the fact that you obtained it. Oh my God, it's a, it, well, okay. Because I, cause, cause I, I could sit here for an hour and a half without technology and without looking up, and I couldn't tell you how or where to get or or how to have <laughs> is it's a it's a modular synthesizers right and after after this podcast we'll fuck around on them for Hell a second yes. because they go with marijuana like peanut butter and jelly wonderful it's wonderful it's my golf but the um the so this to me is uh one of the most exciting things for a person to realize and we and you we, we, i think we forget it by necessity only because because it's such an intense thing to have to deal with the possibility that your field of awareness is infinite and it's gotten super compressed into the human identity for a very temporary amount of time but if you wanted to you could start widening that field of awareness and when you start doing that then suddenly you know you do start noticing stuff that you haven't noticed before right. but then for some people it it becomes a little scary because the things that they start noticing don't fit into the way we understand physics. Mm. And so then they, then they sort of revert back or some people just don't want to, they're, they like the new Island that they found in their exploration of self-improvement and they find it to be better, more fragrant. There's food to eat here way better than the shit Island I came from. <laughs> right. But for some reason they get homesick and then they like sail back to shit island and that's the deg the, the whatever the degradation pattern is that creates that cycle in some people's life of constantly healing and then constantly self-injuring right. constantly heal it's like they're taking a weird commute from heaven to hell back and <laughs> forth for <now. laughs> It's this. It's a ferry boat in the winter from Jersey to Manhattan, yeah. and you just keep taking it over <laughs> and over and over. Yeah. yeah, it's it's yes that that idea is constant. But I feel like I feel like we're all subject to that in 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 a million little ways. We do it all the time in a million ways. Like whether it's fighting with your significant other, even though you know exactly what that boat ride is like. You're like, yeah. I know what that's fucking like. It's freezing. I hate it. I get mad every time I do it. And then at the end, I regret that I did it. And I talk about why I won't do it again. But we all take that ride. We all have to take that ride, which is why going back to what we said before, I think humans are fascinated with how far we can push it. We can push ourselves mentally and physically in so many different, in a million different facets because we want to know what it takes to crack. I want to know. Uh, we all want to know. We all feel it. We all are like, what is it? Like, what is it when you X, Y, Z? Like, what is it like? We all want to know. What is it like to die? Yeah, we want to know so bad. We want to know so bad. Oh, I know. We're yeah. obsessed so bad with death of what it's like to be dead that we, that we fabricated a million different versions of what it is. We're fascinated. There is an endless amount of stories of what people think happens when they die, and there's collections of people that agree with certain ones overwhelmingly. That's does that not, that does that not blow your mind? It's like saying, um, if I told you, uh, I went to Venice. Uh, Venice. I went to Venice when I was in college, and if I told you, man, it is unbelievable. All right. It's unbelievable. Right. And then you go, wow, I've never been on. I hope I could go one day. And then somebody asks you what Venice is like. And you just tell my version of yeah. Venice. That's that's what we're just te you're just telling my version of Venice that, by the way, mine could be total <laughs> bullshit. I could have just totally bullshitted all of it. I might have never gone to Venice, dude. Let's take a quick break. My wife just got back. Oh, OK, OK, OK. Can we continue for a yeah, little longer of course. after this? Yeah, of course. OK. Perfect. Time. 
We're back. We're back, baby. And we're talking about death. <laughs> yeah, so we are. But the yeah. the you know the one like I love all versions of the people's idea of the afterlife. Yeah. All versions are wrong. Yep. Probably. But most likely, yeah. The fervency with which people relate these versions to you is so interesting because like I've had the, you know, the atheist ghost story. I don't know if you've ever gotten this one. No. Which is, and by the way, not nagging atheists or anything like that. Just a certain type of like passionate missionary atheist that just figured out that like the possibility that hell and heaven or the afterlife might not be the way mm -hmm. it was depicted to them by like who whatever the priest class was in their particular religion. And they're really excited and liberated by yeah. that. But then they get really crazily fervent. But I, I had a somebody really like get in my face and like no, you don't understand when you die there's nothing it's gone it's over you're dirt and that's it <laughs> and there's nothing do you hear and it was like trying to scare me yeah with a good time right. you know like you're you're because like, that version is another version of paradise right. which is like full pure, pure freedom. infinite release from all tang and you know mental and karmic entanglements glorious possibility sure you don't have to earn it there's no uh, gauge of like no scales weighing your heart against a feather you just you're out don't worry it's all done wow we can only hope which is why those people who have that view of reality are some of the, like the top optimists in my mind but weirdly they always seem kind of pissed off it's like what are you worried about you only have what 20 more years here before you get to experience permanent anesthesia <laughs> <laughs> that's what you want isn't that what you said you wanted oh, yeah. right well they're mad about it because i think they feel as if um they feel as if it isn't what they thought perhaps or what they were told when they were young so when they come to this moment of clarity of this is actually what they truly believe it to be it's almost like they're bummed like they're almost bummed that it wasn't as um fire and brimstoney story of of these these yeah. typical archetypes of heaven and hell i feel like they are almost sad that they were lied to as a youth about this perfect idea so that they're like they're mad about it but they they know it to be true now now that they're like no but i know it's nothing well yeah they and then that part is fascinating to me because it's like some of the trippiest shit in this type of Buddhism I study is, uh, sorry, y'all, you know, I talk about the same shit, but this stuff is freaks me out and it's awesome. And they, the, the idea is like, okay, so start the, the main idea is like mindfulness, start like just paying attention. That's it. Just start mm -hmm. paying attention. And then in that paying attention, one of the invitations is to start noticing how this thing we're in when we're awake is really very similar to when we're having dreams. And then, so you start looking at that really closely and the, and you realize like, well, there are differences in the sense that in a dream, I'll have a lifetime compressed over a night. So I'll, I'll experience like several different identities over the course of a, a night and then I'll wake up and won't give a fuck about whoever those identities were at all. Yeah. And then, and, and, um, in here, it's a little like there's time, time affects the, the material universe a little differently. So we're experiencing an identical phenomena, which is that I, I can look back at different phases of my life. And I know for sure that those are different dreams. Like those are just different parts. Like my childhood, certainly that's a dream. And then, it, you know, when I look back, it's a foggy memory. It's like, I kind of remember bits and pieces. And then I look back at like, well, when I was in college, boy, that seemed important then. But in the same way, when I wake up from a dream, I don't give a shit about that now no. i think about it here and there and then now this phase of my life that i'm in right now it's very important to me and i and i love it but i imagine that if this pattern is to continue as it has been continuing then this will just be another phase of the dream and so this is the funniest thing is that people are like thinking they've got to wait to die yeah. when you go and look and you realize no you died You've died all, you've had so many incarnations already in this lifetime mm -hmm. that you're probably, there might be some similarities between the you that was getting in fights back then in a fucking rough neighborhood and the you now, but really they're kind of like very different beings and very different, in fact, completely different bodies, completely. So you realize like, oh fuck, 
I'm not only am I dying all the time, you start getting into like the real reality of it, which is like the past and all that stuff that you remember, it's actually gone right now. Like every single moment you're, you're gone. It's gone. We're like centipedes that only have one we're like fake centipedes. We, 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 um, we imagine we have all these segments that are attached to us and that's what we call our past. But the reality of it is like, no, those segments are gone. You're just a centipede head in the present moment, imagining that you've got a centipede tail and then you're making decisions based on the centipede tail that doesn't exist anywhere except in your own head. You're a monopede. We're you're all a, monopedes that think we're centipedes. Fucking, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're neurotic monopedes. We're neurotic monopedes that yeah. assume that we're centipedes. But but that that the phantom, the phantom back of us is, hangs with us because we've, we've put that in our head that that should always be carried that your pain and your yeah. that all the shit from your past that is being drugged behind you is supposed to be there when in fact we're just we're just self-indulgent monopedes who think that all that stuff is supposed to be back there it's important man yeah it's fuck that's remember crazy remember the college days remember remember when don't forget when yeah remember when when when, when terry broke his arm down by the or whatever the fucking thing is it's like yeah, I guess, and I guess that's important, but really that's gone whether it's important or not. And some people like candles to that shit, and some people like build right. an altar to it, and then if you don't respect their fucking phantom goddamn centipede segments, they get all upset because you're right. not like worshiping, which is when I got fucking cancer, man, that was one of the things that goes out the window is like you get this like illusion this idea that like not only does the centipede body go back, you, the, it, you think the centipede body goes forward too. Then when you get sick, you're like, oh shit, I'm definitely, definitely gonna die. <laughs> you know what I mean? This, this is like definitely not a permanent situation. And then suddenly the adherence to getting stuck in the past or worshiping the future, you kind of throw it out the window because it's like, fuck, I, in, in the similar to a dream where one second, Fuck, you know, I had a dream just last night where this girl was giving me a blowjob and then I looked away and looked down and it was some kind of like huge, like fucking beefy dude <laughs> sucking my dick. <laughs> And I was in the What dream. does that say? Are you do you pine for that maybe a little bit? Maybe. Maybe, maybe a big large man sucking your cock is your ultimate fantasy. Well, I'll tell you this. In the dream there was that momentary recognition where like this feels exactly the same regardless of the vehicle of the body right. vehicle of the thing sucking my dick right there's no that was i think maybe one of the shocking parts of the dream <laughs> is completely no difference in <laughs> sensation <laughs> by the way that's how they get you in your dreams the gay recruitment strategy yeah, is to get get in your dreams oh, finally astral gay recruiters are Fine. traveling into my dream to suck my dick then i'm doing something right yeah and they're doing a good job as well well i mean i guess so now You're that a i good think recruit. about it wow guys join up <laughs> join up but but the, the 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 way that that just changed instantly in the dream that's what the, this reality is like too in the sense that like at any moment the thing quote sucking your dick that you think is like the greatest thing ever can just change form or suddenly you don't like the thing or you th then, then everything shifts. You get the phone call, you have an internal realization, you whatever it may be. So the real truth is, isn't this the reason I think people like to push themselves and we like to watch other people push themselves is because we all kind of know that we're in a dream and that there isn't uh, a cohesive self at all and that we're just a kind of like thing that is trying to in every single moment redraw a non-existent form that has not only been annihilated but maybe never existed and that produces <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that's why we like to push ourselves because somewhere in there you you, you get some freedom yeah. from the addiction to this never ending idiotic pushing out of the monopede story, you know, which is right. really annoying to have to do that all the time, isn't it? It is. It gets old. And I, I, everything I just said to you is exactly what I said on the phone during the Joker when I was watching <laughs> as loudly as I could. <laughs> Every, by the way, though, after 
when when I go into deep dives of of things like this and think about like the questioning solely of like purpose and existence and movement and along with each other and carrying stuff from the past and how to move forward and how to live in a the the best way I can feel about all of it is that I finally accepted that like I don't know like I really don't know either what happens when I die or what I'm going to do tomorrow and how it's all going to work out and I just am cool with it like I'm just faith I'm just cool with it I'm just I guess it's faith in I guess it's the belief it is the perfect belief in complete chaotic harmony it's like it's all crazy and it's all working out and it'll figure itself out and and maybe it won't and i just it's okay like sometimes if i was in if i was going through something my mom would always be like you you're you're gonna be fine and it was annoying to hear as a youth i hated it it's like i know i'm gonna be fine i need i need some love right now but Mm. in retrospect it's just it's something to be pummeled into my head because it what she was just saying was like, it's your, the reason you're having stress is because you've engineered it by, by taking what you've taken, taken on in your life. So you've engineered all that stress. Yeah. But it will be fine. It will be fine. Uh, Yeah. That it just, at some point it will be fine. And it, and it does. And then when it starts becoming fine, if you just keep re-reminding yourself that you're engineering it, you're engineering all of these things that you're like, oh, if I built this, I know how to live in it. I constructed it. I just need to, I just need to be okay with it. That sometimes pe- pieces are going to fall. Sometimes I'm going to have to move. Sometimes I'm going to have to fix it or sell it or, or start from scratch again and rebuild it. Like once- sometimes I'm going to be run over in, yeah. in the street. Yep. Sometimes I'm going to be blown up by <laughs> bombs. Sometimes yep. I'm going to like my body's going to like just unexpectedly stop working. Sometimes. And and then you're still going to be okay. That's one of the things one of my teachers, Ramdas, says is dying is completely safe. Yeah. The problem is we don't know that. So we hear shit like that, but we don't know it. But to me, yeah, everything is going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Not for your body. You're, if your body, if you think being fine means maintaining the current form that you're in for eternity, then you're fucked. Then you're fucked. Everything is not going to be fine. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, because this, cause this is not going to go. But that's, you know, sometimes I was talking to somebody the other night and they're like, well, don't you think the world's ending and really upset? And I'm thinking like, well... I mean, this is a political perspective, obviously, right? They were upset that like what's happening politically is, what do they mean? Do they mean like climate change? Right. Okay. 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 And I thought, well, I don't think the world's going to end. I think the way we live in the world is going to change, but Mm -hmm. the world, the world, I don't think the planet itself is going to like turn to dust or ash or something, but I think our experience of civilization more than likely is going to change radically over the next 10 or 20 years, whether we like it or not. And that being said, I think it is a really optimistic thing when people are so certain of their fucking lifespan that they imagine they're going to get to live in that time. It's like, get the fuck out of here. You think you're going to be around in 20 years? How do you know that? Yeah. Where's your fucking temporal ATM that's got these years in it that you even get to be anxious <laughs> right. about being here in the apocalypse? And I'm not saying take a fatalistic approach and just start throwing plastic in the sea or whatever like that. I'm just saying I've noticed a lot of people seem to really just have a basic confidence in their lifespan that is based on a brief assessment of lifespan statistics and probabilities yeah. and they don't think they're the anomaly which is like give me a fucking break i've heard of it all the time someone drives under an underpass some cunt throws a brick through their fucking windshield Kills and you're out of here yeah that's it <laughs> did you predict that was that in your timeline yeah, yeah. Well, no that well i also think like um we we can always be improving and doing better and we should be criti- critical about the way that we treat uh both our environment and ourselves and our fellow people like we should all of these things should exist i agree yeah but at the exact same time it shows our level of complete and utter blind narcissism to think that we are the lucky ones that are going to save the built trillion year old stone as if as if to think that's how but humans are so (laughs) 
We've only been around this thing for an extremely minimalistic, if not completely insignificant amount of time yeah. on this thing, right? Yeah. It, we, did, we basically don't exist. In the Earth's timeline, we didn't even happen, right? If right. you were reading, writing a book, if the Earth wrote a book about itself, we wouldn't even fucking be a footnote. It, it, no. Someone would go, what about the time you had humans? And the Earth would go, oh, fuck. Oh, my God. I, I didn't, we didn't add that. The I constructor knots? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> instructor now yeah i totally forgot about them i forgot i, I didn't even yeah but to, to think that's how important we are to ourselves that we think we are the ones that are not only going to break it that and it's all our fault that also we we forget we should be so lucky for this thing to fuck us off yeah. in a weird disgusting way like yeah. we should be so lucky for the earth to go your generation will be the last one to do this so I can reborn, be reborn and do it again. Yeah. You'd be so fucking lucky so for this lucky. thing to end. Like, yeah. it would be, I, I, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a, a fatalist either and say, like, I hope the rock hits us and I'm going to fucking do yeah. whatever I want. I hope we burn up. No, but I'm saying, like, we are so self-involved that we would assume the rock is going to come kill this the, an asteroid's going to come hit us or this place is going to burn up when we're on it well i that to me is the that is the the thing is it's like the gamble many people seem to be making it's really weird is the global apocalypse is going to strike before their subjective apocalypse and i think that's a, a really weird bet to make it's pretty bold the fucking reality is your apocalypse Oh, I don't need the book of revelations to no. predict that shit. It's happening now. I can tell yeah, you're in it. <laughs> you're and in you it. Just too. look down at your arms. And to and to me, like that's the you know, to get back to this pushing the edge and finding the edge and why we do it is because what is the edge? The edge is the fucking veil concealing some other world where we're no longer encumbered by some perceived limitation, mm -hmm. which is exactly what apocalypse translates to is lifting of the veil. So any transformation is innately apocalyptic and we love the apocalypse. Love. Not, just, not people dying. No, no, no. Not people getting hurt. But yeah, man, it's fucking wonderful to watch the entire fabric of everything that you thought you were and everything you thought. Like I had a mom, I had a dad. I thought my mom and dad would meet my baby. I didn't think I'd have a fucking baby. I, all these things that I thought it's, you know, and when I was with a mom and dad, I would think, I don't think I could survive being, I don't know what that, what's that going to be like? I'm going to be one of those fucking dudes whose mom and dad die. One of those poor, lonely motherfuckers <laughs> you always feel kind of sorry for. And you're like, ah, right. oh, Jesus Christ, man. Well, enjoy spiraling into the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> lonely man. <laughs> you know, And but now that it's happened, it's just like what you were saying. It's like, fuck, I'm still here. I'm here. And everything's still fine yep and i i imagine that that must be the like that's got to be the big surprise party when you're when you're when you're when you die yeah the same phenomena is like oh whoa it keeps going yeah now what the fuck that is i don't know i don't know either that could be the last thing you say before a snake bites you in half and drags your torso down <laughs> right, into the right. fucking pits of Haiti and slowly eats you, <laughs> you spitting you back out oh, yes, eating you again. Forever. <laughs> now I'm sorry I, I feel like I dominated too much of this conversation you didn't it was man. wonderful but so when I come next week to your mm -hmm. show you'd fucking dominate me I think I'm a, I think it's gonna mutual domination and it's mutual respect and love and adoration for mutual for domination sure, man. yeah yeah so I want to be pummeled and I want to pummel okay? pummel I I want, whiskey. I just, How I long does your podcast murders. last? 17 hours. Yes! We do <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect yeah yeah we just we're gonna keep going until we need to stop what kind that's of what whiskey is. are we gonna drink i'm gonna give you something special oh, i'm not gonna tell yeah, you piss. it's You're gonna, gonna be piss good in my mouth. i'm gonna piss in your mouth yeah. i'm gonna piss in your mouth and come in your hair that was a hit i had in 88 piss that piss was in you your mouth and come in your hair my yeah. mom used to sing that when she yeah. would bathe me yeah, when, yeah. when, when well, i was in college yeah it was a one hit i was a one-hit wonder but uh man those days were good baby. that song is always piss your mouth and come in your hair available still i believe i believe on itunes i believe you still can download piss in your mouth and come in your hair but oh uh, for sure there's I, bootlegs of it everywhere i was just gonna too. say i don't seek any royalty anymore i just let it go tomorrow you're headed to uh, zany's i go to zany's in nashville this yeah tomorrow yep I'm zany's gone. in nashville this will come out on friday 
So definitely see Andrew. If you're in, Zanies. if you're in Nashville, come out. Otherwise, if you're in San Francisco next weekend, I'm there. And you've got a 2020 Red Rocket podcast yeah. tour. Yeah, the tour. I'm doing a tour. I'm doing. Uh, I mean, stand-up stand up tour, tour. and it's some called, podcasts. Yeah, yeah, and I'm there. doing podcast stuff out there too. Um, but go to andersantino.com for all that stuff. But I'm doing a 2020 tour of like, I've never done small theaters. I'm doing small theaters oh, for the first time. The best. I know. I'm so excited, man. Woo, congrats. Yeah, That's a big transition. It's a heavy man. leap. Yeah. I just want to try. I mean, they're not massive theaters. I'm not, you know, I'm not, but they're small, fun, cool, intimate theaters because I wanted to just try something different. I just was like, maybe I'll step out of the club and do cool little theaters and get more intimate. And that way the shows can last the way they want. There is no check drop. There's a bunch of different elements that. I'm ready for that. I want to try. You must, when you have a chance, as you're falling asleep tonight, mm -hmm. using Neville Goddard's insane hyperdimensional time travel mnemonic fucking thing, you got to travel back to you when you were just starting stand up. I, w I do. And I do it often. Actually, you need to tell him. Okay. I was on a podcast and I actually said, "Well, they're not huge theaters." <laughs> <laughs> I know. Success, yeah, my that, friend. Yes, yes. You did it. That's so cool, it man. It is. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very proud. I, I, I'm, I'm excited, but I'm like any comic, any level of success, you get nervous about a little bit because you're, I don't know. There's a, there's always a moment of like, oh man, I worked exactly, I worked very hard for this, and this is what I wanted, and then you also get anxiety about why did I want it? <laughs> there's oh, a piece yeah. of you, but I know, I know it's because I want to service my fan base in a different way. Like I just want to, I want to be able to connect with them differently than I did prior. And maybe this is a new tr way. And if it doesn't work, we'll figure out something else. Like if fuck, yes, yeah. it is a new way. Yeah, and it's, and it's, way. Well, it's wonderful. And I think people at those kinds of shows, no club shows are great. Don't get me wrong. It's all great. If you're getting a chance to perform, but in those theaters, when you really have fully your audience yeah. that's there and they're, they're excited to and see immersed, you. they're immersed in it yeah. with you. Yeah. I want to feel that man. I love going to see, a show and not just seeing the performer that I'm enjoying, but then also like look around and like, fuck all these fucking people love this, this, this thing. art form. Yeah. And that's a real, and that I really like that in a theater setting that I don't know the community. It's the community. It's a community. Feeling. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, it really is. Man, go see Andrew on his red rocket tour on uh, at Zany's or, you know, just go to his website. You'll and see all my dates. Yeah. Hare Krishna, thank you so much for being thank on the so show. Thank you so much, brother. That was awesome. That was fantastic. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you, Andrew Santino, for coming on the show. Thank you, Omax Health. That's offer code Duncan if you want 20% off their cryo freeze. And go to audible.com and use offer code DTFH to get a free audiobook and a couple of free originals. Thank you for listening. If you like the DTFH, subscribe to us. Give us a nice rating on iTunes and subscribe to us at patreon.com forward slash DTFH to get commercial free episodes and extra like hour long rambling things that I do once a month, along with some other great stuff. That's patreon.com forward slash DTFH. Thanks for listening to y'all and I'll see you next week. Until then, Hare Krishna. Oh, come see me in Denver at the end of January. Okay, I'm out of here. Bye. I love you. See you later.